I'm your colleagues, and this is the third in this quarter of uh, Design at Large Talks. Uh, and we have a continuing awesome set of speakers. Uh, I'm really happy to introduce Ben Fry, uh, who's going to talk to us today uh, about data as a design problem. Uh, and Ben is, uh, I guess this is the official kind of stuff. Uh, he got his undergraduate degree at CMU. Uh, and then moved to MIT, got a master's degree there, got a PhD from uh, uh, the Media Lab. Uh, and I think the title of his thesis was uh, Computational Information Design. He's probably best known uh, for uh, being one of the uh, fathers of processing language and uh, software system uh, with Casey Rees. Uh, the hand in hand with our undergraduate and graduate students at MIT. Uh, and that's had a tremendous, if you go to processing.org, uh, it's had a tremendous impact. It's a huge community that's moved into the uh, JavaScript version, Python versions, and Scala, uh, Ruby, it's a disaster. Yeah, keep going. <laughs> and, uh, and so uh, he's written three books, uh, two on processing, one on data visualization. Uh, he's got a whole host of awards. Uh, my favorite is uh, a national design award that was presented to him at the White House and handed to him by uh, Michelle Obama, uh, which I think was pretty cool. Uh, and, uh, and then uh, he started a company, Fathom Information Design, which is a very interesting uh, visualization uh, company. Uh, and then I asked some people, like Shannon, his wife, uh, and Casey Reeves, for some of the dirt, you know, what do we not know about them? And I really can't tell you all of that. They responded uh, in kind of looking for something like a little tidbit about Pat Hanrahan that he's never taken a computer science course, which I thought was just really great uh, kind of thing. But they told me some things. Uh, for example, he has four pieces in the permanent collection at the Museum of Modern Art. Uh, he plays both the keyboard and ukulele. Uh, he Boy. makes awesome popovers, uh, I am told. Uh, and uh, his earliest design work was for that famous firm, uh, the famous store uh, Domino's Pizza in Ann Arbor, uh, which uh, he's moved on to. And, and just to finish up, I think he's one of the sort of a new generation of people in this area of design. There's lots of really great designers, and there's lots of really great software people. But it's incredibly, incredibly rare to have those happen in the same person. And I just hope we all see a whole series of folks with that kind of expertise. So, awesome. Thank you. Great, way too kind. Um, <laughs> Domino's Pizza and Popovers. All right. Uh, that I won't be covering today. Um, so uh, what I'm going to talk about today, obviously uh, data as a, as a design problem, um, I'm actually going to show a handful of actually a couple of older projects and hopefully show how kind of how we wind up where we are now and uh, hopefully that'll kind of help tell the story of what, what we're up to. Um, as, uh, as Jim mentioned, uh, I did my master's and PhD at the, uh, the Media Lab at MIT. Um, I was part of this group called the Aesthetics and, Comput Aesthetics and Computation Group, and uh, everyone in the group had some sort of uh, background that was a mix between some aspect of the visual arts, so art, design, architecture, et cetera, um, plus some kind of engineering, uh, mathematics, uh, you know, computer science, um, physics, astrophysics, things like that. and. Um, and so it was this uh, really interesting sort of playground to uh, work with all these other people who had these, uh, these dual interests. That for me, I had um, done design and, and uh, code is sort of two separate things. You know, so the uh, <laughs> Domino's Pizza job was in, um, uh, in high school. I was working as a graphic designer uh, for them, and, um, which you know, paid better uh, than uh, what my friends were doing. Um, but also separately was interested in doing software and would like, you know, um, do things in code and then never really found a good way to merge them until, um, you know, that I, I was uh, looking at doing 
you know, UI design and things like that. But it wasn't really until I met John Maida and wound up at the, uh, the Media Laboratory that I found a way to merge things that, or sort of merge these two sides that um, came together in a way that made more sense and, um, you know, really got to what I was, what I was interested in. Uh, when I started there, um, I started looking at things uh, in terms of, you know, as a designer, what, uh, what happens when you add code. So instead of, as a designer, you take, you know, uh, you take a set of constraints, you take a set of information, you try and create the best possible representation of it, um, and, you know, as soon as you're done with it, it's actually out of date by the time you're finished. And so, you know, what, what happens when you can actually work within a uh, context of code? And so I started building things like this. This is um, reading through the text of a book, um, constructing a uh, network out of it, is, of uh, showing adjacencies between words. The more often certain words are found, they fight their way to the outside. Um, but really, how do you, you know, set up a series of rules, um, you know, within the computer science and programming side of it, and then, uh, you know, feed information into it. And then as a designer, you're sort of tweaking those rules to get a desired visual result, you know. So this, uh, we're trying to move the more useful things to the outside, um, you know, give you a better way to read a book or something like that. Um, but uh, really what we're looking at here is trying to see how things change, uh, change over time. And that at the time, so this is uh, 1999, um, the most compelling thing about it was really that, you know, it was round, it was in 3D, it had type on it, it moved, and so people were kind of responding to that more so than, you know, this is how networks are changing over time and, you know, ways of kind of feeding data into a representation and having it, um, seeing how that uh, visualization actually metabolized that, uh, that data. Um, it, it did wind up in a movie, though, so here's uh, Tom Cruise in Minority Report um, checking his email in 2054 and, um, you know, getting uh, hopefully useful <coughs> Uh, results, the mail looks messy. Um, you know, standard fare in uh, Windows 2054. Um, from there, moved on to uh, looking at genetics. You know, so uh, genetics was interesting as far as uh, for my PhD work, being able to take, you know, something that worked in terms of, you know, it's a really, uh, it's a massive data problem. Um, it's also timely that, you know, so it was 2000, and so the uh, first draft of the human genome had just been completed. Um, this is something that, you know, can kind of uh, give you enough to work on and also, uh, you know, for a couple of years. Um, and also to uh, have something that was really, you know, that there's this massive gap between what we understood, what um, scientists were beginning to understand about the genome and also what the public understood about the fact that the uh, human genome was now sequenced or that there was a draft version of that sequence available. And so um, also that because this was open data, um, I was able to, even before, you know, really making contacts within the uh, genetics community, uh, I was able to start working with the data and start, you know, sorting uh, things out with it. Um, eventually, I uh, got in touch with folks who were looking at uh, uh, variation data. So this is, you know, looking at uh, 500 different individuals, um, every couple hundred letters, you know, just take those single letter changes, see what kind of uh, groupings and structures we get. Um, and so they would make representations like these. So these are all the same type of data. Um, this is just a redesigned version, you know, just doing the, you know, kind of visual cleanup stuff from this uh, to this. Um, that was the, the first version I did. But then I said, you know, there's really, we're really talking about the same data set. And so can we actually link all those representations together? And so building something like this where, you know, here we're going to expand it out and actually be able to read the letters off. Or um, some people don't like the this sort of qualitative, um, you know, bar chart kind of version. I just want to be able to see these individual percentages. Um, or we can move it into 3D and so we can get more of these connections in between the, uh, the different blocks. But that's also kind of a, a waste of a dimension. So instead you can uh, put another set of data on that z-axis. And then having done that, you now have, you know, this other diagram that we were just looking at, you know, um, by being able to look at it from, from above. And so, you know, here just trying to take um, ways that would bridge, you know, sort of what was happening within the biology and genetics community and um, the types of things we're thinking about in terms of what, what can you do with um, interactively working through a visualization. You know, so down in the corner here we have the, the statistics that are used to actually, you know, define these different groupings. And so you can actually play with the statistic and have undo and visually be getting feedback on, you know, how well things are going. But also, in order to do that, it means rewriting how that entire piece of software works and how that algorithm works. And so you can't really separate this sort of the design side of things from the, uh, that code part of 
you know, the algorithm that went into, and the statistics that went into uh, building this representation. So now we're up to 2004. Um, along with this, one of the things that um, Casey and I started doing in, in 2001 at uh, the Media Lab was uh, this thing called processing. And so what we um, saw was basically a connection between you know, these uh, projects I was just showing in terms of you know, how we work in, in our own projects. You know, we want to be able to kind of sketch something out with code and then uh, port it to something more specific. But you know, how do we get a little bit closer to sketching with code? But also, how do we um, teach other people to do the same, you know, the same kind of work? And so the group that we were in, um, Professor Might always had a, we always had a significant pedagogical push in, ter in terms of it only gets more interesting if we can actually get as many people into the field as, as possible. And also, you know, it, um, I think it only starts getting interesting when you have people who come in who, you know, so you get people coding who aren't naturally, you know, uh, drawn to coding or that you get people doing design who were more uh, drawn toward engineering. And so how do you start um, crossing disciplines that way and sort of, um, well, we'll get into that a little bit. Uh, so the result was this uh, processing project that, you know, uh, because we saw this similarity between the way that we would try and teach people to code and the t kinds of things that we wanted to be simple with our own work and the way that we wanted to be able to um, iterate quickly and kind of write a page of code and see what you know, see what happened and um, try out a different idea and then feel okay about throwing it away and, you know, we didn't want to do a whole integrated development environment and things like that, but um, can we kind of have a way of script, like a, something that feels like scripting even though it's more performant um, underneath the, uh, or behind the scenes. And so uh, over time this has just kind of um, grown a little bit out, out of control. Um, the, uh, uh, so this is as of last month, you know, so the number of people actually using the processing environment, so we're up at about a quarter million people. Um, and so this is exciting as far as just how the, the range of that, and then all these other projects that kind of, you know, shot out of that as far as, you know, things like Arduino, they've, you know, uh, gone significantly higher than this, but, you know, taking the same kinds of ideas, using the processing development environment to be able to apply that to hardware and, uh, and so on, and so this is really, um, you know, and this wasn't KCRI's research that this was, uh, you know, sort of our side project. So some of you are trying to finish your PhD now, and um, don't let this happen to you. <laughs> um, the, uh, uh, the other part is, you know, what I was referring to as far as how we cross people over. So, you know, a couple years ago we wrote this really important mission statement. Um, so processing project seeks to ruin the careers of talented designers by tempting them away from their usual tools into the world of programming and computation. Uh, similarly, the pro similarly, the project is designed to turn engineers and computer scientists to less gainful employment as artists and designers. Um, and it is, you know, to, to my greatest pride in the project that we've actually been able to do this to some people and sort of like <laughs> breaking them, um, which is really kind of exciting. Uh, and really the, the amazing thing that's happened with the project is the community that has uh, built around it. Um, a lot of the uh, the majority of that, the credit for that goes to Casey, who um, you know really did a, an amazing job from the outset, uh, trying to get different people to you know sort of uh, commission work for it and really building out this exhibition and getting people thinking about um, you know different ways of using code. That it's not a matter of you know making little visual things on screen, but rather um, you know so uh, 3D printed folding sculptures, kinetic light uh, installations. Uh, other, you know, vision-based interactive things, and so uh, on processing.org you should check out the, uh, the exhibition, just sort of an amazing range of things that people have built um, with it. We have a lot of time to go there. <laughs> right. Hard to page after page of it. It's, so, um, the, uh, and I also use this within my own work as a way of, um, you know, thinking through different ideas or uh, being able to sketch or prototype things that I'm uh, curious about. So. Uh, a number of years ago, a, a friend of mine um, who worked in uh, biology was uh, telling me about how she had been, you know, sort of going back to first principles and reading, uh, you know, Origin of Species by Darwin and reading uh, Wallace's paper, you know, so Wallace and Darwin um, had, you know, kind of come up with the same idea around the same time. And so um, I was really fascinated about this idea, you know, and she said, well, actually, the uh, over time, Darwin's Origin of Species actually changed a great deal, you know, that he actually wrote it and rewrote it and edited it. And so I was um, fascinated by this idea of like, well, one, you know, we can actually see what 
see this person's thinking and see how that ev that evolution, how that change happens. Um, but also like, what you know, did Darwin, who is you know upper class uh, society, and Wallace, who is not, and did Darwin kind of slowly siphon all of his ideas out of the you know the Wallace paper and so on? Um, and so that was you know that was fascinating. And so um, I set out to you know build something that would help me uh, look at this and understand it. So. As it turns out, the first edition of Origin of Species, you know, and, and the part of the premise here too is one of the things I love about design or the thing that I most like about design is this idea of being able to take uh, any random thing that you're curious about and sort of turn it into work. And so um, I realized this at some point during my, you know, my freshman year in college. Um, but the, uh, you know, so here we've got uh, six editions of Dar Darwin's Origin of Species over the course of uh, the six English language editions that he did uh, happened over the course of 14 different years. Um, over the left-hand side, it's uh, each edition just written out. So you see it go from about 160,000 words up to about 100, 190,000 words. Um, and this browser here just shows sort of the track changes version of that text. You know, so each column is one edition, and that edition compared with, uh, with the next. So here's um, Darwin you know, cursing his way through Microsoft Word. And, um, you know, sort of trying to get, figure out his theory of uh, natural selection. And so what we start seeing is, you know, patterns in terms of uh, maybe a third of the changes are actually, you know, substantive and important uh, things that have shifted. Another third are just kind of, you know, a little bit of rewriting. And then another third are actually new material that's, um, that's coming in. But this is just kind of the diagnostic, diagnostic version of the, um, the text. It's, you know, here's the answer to the question, what is a million... Uh, words look like and how can we kind of browse, browse through it efficiently um, on just a you know, typical uh, laptop, which is another interesting thing in terms of design and visualization at this, at this point where we can just do this very, uh, very simply on, on very basic hardware. Um, this is my competitor. So 50 years prior, this guy Morse Peckham actually took the entire text of all six editions, uh, wrote it out line by line on index cards, um, covered his apartment, office, et cetera, um, and actually produce this massive book that uh, does all of the, you know, goes through every single uh, change and every edit and, uh, and so on. And so uh, when I showed the initial version of the interactive stuff to uh, a Darwin scholar, it's like, uh, who's going to want to look at this? This is an interesting. We've already got the book. Um, and so it looks, uh, looks something like this. But just this idea that we can actually take, you know, what was this this one book that's the purview of Darwin scholars and instead put it online in a very simple interactive uh, piece that uh, can really widen the audience of people who um, can have access to it and can think about it uh, is really quite fascinating. <coughs> uh, the next iteration of that uh, may not want to run. Nope, pardon me. The, uh, the next iteration was taking the, uh, taking the text and building out a composite version that actually shows how the uh, book changed over time, which unfortunately that, um, but that was done for a different setting for a gallery audience and so on, and also accompanied with a, a poster that you could actually see all of, the, uh, all of the text as well as sort of that you know, composite piece. So a little bit more direct than this sort of track changes thing. <coughs> Pardon. Uh, but then a third version being, uh, if you were actually looking at a different domain, so if you were trying to uh, use this for a course or actually, you know, really study these changes, this takes on a very different sort of form. And so that uh, this is instead a uh, tablet version that looks at, you know, that the uh, focus changes to how do you, you know, compare between editions and how do you annotate in different portions and things like that. And so just going with this idea that uh, depending on the audience, depending on the context of use, there's a real shift, even though we're, you know, essentially dealing with the same uh, underlying data and just different ways of, of thinking about it. Um, fast forwarding uh, a couple years, for the last uh, six years, seven years, um, I've been running a studio in, in Boston. Um, this, is, this is our group. Um, they are always this happy. Um, <laughs> actually, this guy is leaving us, so apparently we're excited about him going. Um, but uh, this is one of the things that, you know, we uh, like the Darwin piece, 
uh, one of the things that we try and do is to continue um, thinking about um, uh, how to you know, sort of pursue these different curiosities and sort of unpack different data sets that we're curious about. And this is an example of a project that uh, uh, Mark Schifferly in our studio did where he uh, was curious about uh, Miles Davis and telling the story of all of his uh, collaborators over time. Pardon? Uh, that he worked with some 600 different studio music musicians over the course of his career, which is just sort of a phenomenal uh, you know, thing to think about. So this was the first draft version that he built. Um, you know, like, is there anybody named John who played jazz? Um, and so we can uh, uh, pull out these different, uh, different pieces. You know, the, each of these dots is one, one individual person. But um, the thing is, what's happening here is it's really kind of, you know, it has this sort of like data viz aesthetic thing that it's like a, you know, a lot of thin lines and dots and it's kind of um, obtuse and, hey, look, Miles Davis was on all of the Miles Davis albums. Um, and so what we're always trying to do is figure out how to instead um, focus on what, you know, what's a more direct way of telling that story about those collaborations. And so the final version that uh, he created instead has this uh, constellation at the top of uh, these points. Each of these are uh, individual musicians, and they're sized based on how, uh, how many sessions they actually played on. And their horizontal location is kind of roughly the middle of their career of you know, collaboration with Miles. And we put the timeline right in the center there and uh, provide a way to look at, you know, so here's Herbie Hancock, and now I can look at every single uh, session that we, uh, Herbie Hancock did along with um, Miles Davis. And then, oh, that's interesting, so what about Michael Hen uh, Henderson with electric bass and where are those uh, intersections? And so hopefully here, getting closer to telling that, uh, that story a bit more uh, directly. And, um, and then we did a print version of it, you know, so we weren't quite done with the interactive version, and so with print, totally different context, uh, but you know, you're uh, in completely different set of affordances, so we have an enormous amount of detail that you can do in print that you can't do on screen, um, but you also can't you know, click on things and hover things and be able to expand anything, so how do you, um, what's an appropriate you know, representation for that information? Um, and also, if it's, a, uh, if it's a print, it needs to function as something that's, you know, that goes in your wall. So do you want the star field of dots, or do you want something that's uh, more of a form that you know, sort of uh, says, something, says something a little different? And so this is the, uh, the front sort of working. It's a uh, timeline running in a sort of almost a little over 270 degree uh, angle, sort of riffing off of a, a record. Um, this is on the back side, all of the uh, the individual people, because what we wanted to see was, let's see all 600 people in one uh, instance uh, here and be able to see all of those tick marks along the, uh, the time scale. Um, and James, who worked on the, uh, the design for this, these were some of the images. He found this image of a record um, that he really loved and sort of you know, was keying off of that with this gold ink. Um, this is this really wonderful um, microscopic version of the, what a record's uh, groove looks like. Um, we'd love to figure out a way of like incorporating that, um, but then the uh, the poster itself looks like like this with a few uh, a few details. But just you know, going to this idea of different different mediums, different contexts of use have uh, really very different representations and way of think ways of thinking about the uh, the data. Uh, because we can't play with Miles Davis records and and uh, Darwin all day, um, we also do some client things. <laughs> Uh, this was a, a, a database from the uh, Food and Agricultural Organization from the UN. Um, we were contacted by National Geographic that they wanted to tell something about the story of uh, food and consumption and what, I'm sorry, not consumption, but uh, they're doing a whole series on the future of food. And FAO has this amazing database and so they wanted to uh, you know, sort of find something interesting within that. So, Several iterations later, we wound up with this, um, this piece that looks at uh, food consumption over time and look, looking at that uh, country by country. So uh, with this um, chart, we've got the uh, average daily calories and then broken down um, by 
uh, dairy and eggs, produce, uh, sugar and fat, grain, etc. You know, so here's sugar and fat. Yay, we're number one. <laughs> Hooray for us. Um, and you know, we can run this back and see how this has changed uh, over time. Uh, and just trying to pick out different ways of uh, you know, telling a story like this. Um, and some of the affordances in terms of, you know, is it grams per person that, we're, that we care about? Is it calories per person? And that, you know, just with some really simple interactions, we can switch, um, you know, so grams of produce uh, outweighs things, but it's a very different, uh, has a very different meaning to it. Um, meat consumption, you know, so then just taking that meat wedge and really um, looking at it closely. Um, so world meat consumption is up 86% over 50 years. Um, you know, China's rise is really quite remarkable over that period. Um, you know, here's the U.S., uh, an incredible, you know, so this chicken in every pot idea was this aspirational thing that, you know, we now eat double the amount of chicken as we did uh, 50 years ago. Uh, India, famously, a lot of uh, vegetarians, or predominantly vegetarian. Um, Hong Kong and the rise. Uh, you know, Russia, some, uh, some ups and downs. Uh, but I think one of the things we love to see is where um, data sets like this really mirror uh, what's happening uh, in world events, what's happening historically. So here's the invasion of Kuwait uh, in the uh, Iraq war, and so this massive drop in terms of uh, uh, meat consumption within Kuwait, uh, and similar types of things happening within um, Libya as well, that uh, some of these you're seeing you know, differences in terms of taste. And so um, with this, you know, we started with just this raw data set, this massive you know, uh, set of tables, and um, culled it down to you know, doing uh, food and uh, the actual consumption. And then country by country went through and uh, sort of you know, wrote these different pieces of text that actually provide context for you know, what actually, <laughs> so what's happening in Cuba here where uh, things uh, drop off about oh, 20, 30 years ago. Um, and so being able to uh, tell some of those stories back to by uh, the raw data itself. But um, it's a very simple representation, um, and, uh, but was kind of incredible as far as the reach that that got, um, including 90s pop stars. Um, so <laughs> here's you know, MC Hammer, What the World Eats. Uh, hashtag data science. <laughs> and so, which, and the, the thing that I, I love about, uh, I mean, aside from it being MC Hammer, but uh, the other part that I love about this, you know, so here's a 90s pop star who's saying hashtag data science. And so the, the idea that data is even on his radar is really kind of amazing. You know, so like for, uh, for me having, you know, back when I was doing my master's or PhD that, Plenty of people doing uh, data work at the time, but the just that's seen such a massive shift in the last ten years, in the last five years, even uh, last twenty years. Uh, people in the room have been doing it even, you know, significantly longer. Um, but the uh, the it says a, sort of a wonderful thing about this sort of zeitgeist, or you know, maybe this is a little bit scary that uh, people are paying attention to this. Um, and the thing that I, you know, within uh, Fathom, the thing that I'm most interested in at the moment is this idea of uh, things that are more platform projects. You know, so the National Geographic thing is a matter of, you know, it's a couple weeks and you know, uh, one or two or three people uh, kind of hashing out you know, what's, uh, you know, what the stories are, what, the data, uh, what slice of the data we actually want to work with. Can we actually say what we're saying with the data, you know, working with domain experts to, say, you know, to sort that out? Um, but I think a lot more interesting is where we can look at much larger data sets. And so, we were contacted by um, Thomson Reuters to do a project on uh, China during uh, a couple years ago when the, the um, once in a decade transition was happening within the Communist Party. So basically the uh, Politburo Standing Committee uh, changes over every, uh, every 10 years. There's an election. Um, and so, you know, this is a fascinating sort of story to tell in terms of how that's, how that's changing, who these people are, where did they come from, what's, um, you know, there's just so many layers of this to actually uh, get into, and so they wanted to build a, a tablet application out of that, and so we jumped at the chance to um, look at that, and that we're gonna work with a series of 
uh, domain, a set of domain experts and researchers at Reuters who are going to be collecting all this data as we were doing the design for the actual piece and actually building all the infrastructure to support it. Um, so the result, this is the, uh, the resulting application. Um, one of the sections is the social view, so basically looking at the soft connections between people. So here's Xi Jinping, the uh, current president, and his you know, social network. Uh, and the, uh, you know, so the different individuals that are actually connected to him. Um, this view here, this is looking at the, uh, it's called the institutional power view, and so it's instead the hierarchic version or the on paper version of the way that these people are supposed to be related to each other. And so the, the social view is kind of the soft connections, the institutional is the, um, the hard connections, but you know, within the application we can always move back and forth between these different uh, representations. Um, Politics in China is also extremely structured, that there are actual uh, tiers that um, people can achieve, and so there's a, a timeline view there of being able to literally look at the arc of somebody's uh, career in context. And then here, kind of getting into Reuters' uh, more typical bread and butter of um, uh, reporting and in, in-depth articles and you know, things like that. Um, so behind all of this uh, sits you know, tens of thousands of entities, so an entity being a, an individual person or um, an organization or a, uh, a company. Um, in, the, in this final one, we had uh, 30,000 relationships, but that, you know, varied over the course of the project, and then about 1.5 million words of text. And the whole point is to never, you never want somebody to actually sit at it and say, boy, this must be tens of thousands of things and 30,000 relations, you know, tens of thousands of relationships and millions of words. Um, another thing we enjoy about projects like this is really kind of getting into uh, a new domain, you know, so another, you know, sort of referring back to the, you know, why is design so fun. Um, here we can, uh, this was one of the books that we read on, uh, you know, just understanding how, how politics in China actually works. And so, you know, spending a couple months kind of really digging into that. Um, and that data looks something like this. So it, we'll build something on the, this li these lines. Uh, this is just a sketch, this is a small fraction of, you know, so this is a few hundred nodes, a few thousand edges, um, and it, what, this is a, what became that actual uh, social power view, you know, so the connections between people. And so we'll uh, do something like this to say, all right, how much can we simplify this? Because uh, this is a great example of what we never want to put in front of people, you know, because it's like, oh, the data, it's complex. It's like, yeah, congratulations to me. It's complex. Um, and you know that that's kind of a typical thing for, you know, watch out for folks working with data that way because people like to brag about how complex their data is. Um, and then this is uh, that plus a round of design. So uh, designers and developers working very closely together and saying, what are structures that we can start pulling out of this? And you know, do we need the first degree connections or the second degree or the, um, you know, how far do we actually need to go? to actually tell a decent story. And what we found was that we can actually do the, uh, really focus on those, those first degree connections and have the second degree in the, uh, in the background, but that that would actually give us enough, uh, enough meat to actually work. Uh, and so this is you know, an example of something that we built in processing, uh, again, dealing with you know, a fair amount of data. And then once we sort out what's happening here, we do a couple more rounds of design and then port it all into you know, the JavaScript front end of. Um, you know, this here, the, uh, the final version of that representation. Um, and we do, you know, we did a lot of uh, tools like this. This is another one that, you know, so the size of each of those dots for the people um, in the representation, we figured out, an, you know, sort of a mix of uh, an algorithm and a weighting system, but also actually having domain experts sit with us and tweak all of those weights and uh, do that visually. So over here in the corner, those individual weights, over at the left are uh, the top few hundred most important people, and uh, you know we basically use this to kind of figure out exactly how we wanted to uh, to group things. Um, and just you know design-wise, this goes through an enormous number of iterations. This is what the uh, very first version of what that front page looked like, the the red screen with the icons. Um, this was just a couple weeks into the project. Uh, then it became this. This is um, a little too newsy. Um, they said they wanted something really simple. We didn't really believe them, so we still had this paragraph of text. Um, and they said, no, no, we really want this, you know, sort of uh, five-tier version. Um, and so that's where we went with the, uh, with the final. But uh, again, sort of the, 
rounds and rounds of design iteration, uh, going back and forth with the client, working internally, working back and forth with the data, taking what we learned from the data, using that to feed into the design decisions. Um, you know, one of the things we found, originally this was going to be uh, just four sections, and the career comparison data was just so uh, interesting that we actually had to elevate that up. And so, that, you know, again, that's sort of seeing how the, those data sets evolve, and this is why we do data and design sort of under the same, uh, the same roof that you can't sort of separate out the, you know, Reuters doing all the IT stuff and then we'll just kind of put a pretty front end on top of it. Um, and also along with that, doing all of the, this is a, the whole back end system that we built to uh, support it, that we had no IT support uh, within Reuters, so we needed to launch it straight out of EC2, actually have things up and running with production and put it out to launch and we didn't know who was gonna show up or how many people would show up and um, that needed to be just completely bulletproof. Um, so the, the reaction, um, the, so the project went live at four o'clock one afternoon uh, and it was banned in China by the next morning, <laughs> um, which was kind of fun because it was like, oh, that, that really does happen. That's, that's a thing. Um, and you know, we also had things like a couple months later um, you know, but we, even in spite of that, we got an enormous amount of traffic. We had about a quarter million users in the first week or two, and then about um, 400,000 over the course of the first year or so. Um, and so, you know, with that, getting this is the uh, a slower reaction that came from the um, uh, state news agency. Um, you know, that they're like, oh, you don't need this connect to China thing we have our own version, um, which is kind of great. And so, you know, that it's all, uh, you know, here's Xi Jinping and here's, you know, here's other lieutenants and um, sort of putting this all uh, together in one place. And, um, you know, but this took several months for it to, you know, uh, come along and, uh, but just that this would also be like, oh, it's okay to ban that other thing because, you know, we have this one. And, um, but also like that this one, it's, uh, it's interactive. So, woo. <laughs> Pretty hot. Um, you know, this, this got uh, derided um, over in the uh, press over in Taiwan. Um, but then uh, even a little later, so Sina uh, comes along with this and we're like, that's amazing. <laughs> um, and so the uh, so this uh, the amazing thing for this being you know if you've never had the experience of having somebody take you know one of your projects and like reflect it back to you it's really kind of incredible you know the nav is on the right side not the left side um, but uh, you know it's the our exact colors lifted out um, every you know all these different uh, details pulled out of it. Um, we heard through the grapevine that they were, you know, like, oh yeah, sign of the, uh, the uh, head of uh, design there is a, is a big fan. It's like, <laughs> no shit. <laughs> um, so kind of, yeah, kind of, uh, kind of amazing. Um, so g an interesting iteration in terms of how the, you know, the project took on these different, uh, these different forms. Um, I think a thing I would love to do is be able to come back and do a version that's more uh, situated for people within China and actually really focus on particular audiences and different uh, different people who might use a, a tool like this and have a, uh, an interactive version that's more pointed toward that. Um, and so going off of the audience point, this last uh, thing I would like to show is uh, this No Ceilings project that we've been working on with the uh, Gates Foundation and Clinton Foundation. And the, we were approached by them to look at um, the progress of women and girls over the last 20 years, and basically can, uh, can we collect enough data about that to actually be able to show um, you know, where we are seeing progress, where we're, not seeing, where we're seeing setbacks, um, can we see some of these uh, differences happening over time. Um, can we see our browser again? So uh, this here, this is a really simple uh, visualization we have up up front, this is the uh, gender gap in workforce participation starting in 1995 and going through 2012. And so we can, you know, just slowly see, so uh, 
men in this sort of aqua color, uh, women in orange, and sort of slowly seeing the, uh, in 100% labor force participation at the top, zero at the bottom. And so over time, we can see that um, condensing a little bit, perhaps not enough, definitely not enough, um, different ways of arranging the data. And so, uh, and then also just individually looking at um, each of the uh, countries involved. So each one of these lines is one, uh, one country. And so that's one of you know, a, a dozen or so different uh, visualization pieces that we built um, to support this work. And the thing that uh, they wanted us to do was really to say, uh, we need to be able to reach different kinds of audiences. And so they, um, in particular, they wanted to reach uh, millennial women and uh, policymakers, because you know, like <laughs> they, you know, they have the same interests and needs, and so, um, and that we needed, you know, that it needed to be uh, straightforward and approachable enough that people would be uh, interested in sharing this and, uh, you know, uh, well, I'm sharing it, and uh, but also have enough depth that we could actually get back to all of the the data, and so we have these you know, sort of tear off things uh, like this. So, you know, the US is one of nine countries worldwide that doesn't provide for uh, paid maternity leave. So it's basically the US and a bunch of uh, island nations. It's actually really embarrassing. Um, huge gap in terms of uh, women having internet access. So, uh, and you think about what internet access means in terms of uh, development, in terms of how you, uh, how you get ahead, in terms of education, in terms of business, et cetera. Um, this is a, a huge issue in terms of it for, uh, for women, and especially in the developing world. Um, one in three women suffers physical or sexual violence, really upsetting. Um, but then with this, we're always having this, you know, about the data section, so we can get people back to the original, uh, original sources, original studies, et cetera. Uh, instead of just kind of having these little tear off, you know, quotes that people like to, um, you know, cite, but really we want to make sure that the, the meat is still there and that people can, um, you know, interact with that. Uh, and so the sharing portion, you know, worked reasonably well. Here's uh, folks on uh, Twitter sharing out some of that work. Um, underneath there's, you know, 850,000 data points that we put together, uh, almost 1,000 indicators. <coughs> Excuse me. Across, across just shy of 200 countries in uh, 20 years. And you know, so the data came to us looking like this. It's a couple hundred thousand rows, fascinating. Um, and different themes and indicators, uh, so themes like education and so on. Um, and we built uh, tools, as with the China Project, uh, you know, very simple tool to look at each of these indicators, uh, be able to map it out, see how it changes over time, see what our data coverage is like. There's these little pie charts. And so we build these sort of like hideous looking things um, that let us do some of the analysis and support some of the work and have uh, so that more people in the uh, studio can actually be working with the data than just the developers or just the, the designers. Um, and then from there we start working on pulling out these different uh, stories. Um, this was another representation of just where the gaps are in the data, like how, uh, so one row per indicator uh, horizontally, it's uh, each country and just uh, High, you know, the uh, intensity based on how, uh, how much data we have for that item. Uh, within each of those indicators, then trying to pull out different, uh, different, different uh, takeaways and stories. So here we can start seeing there's something interesting happening in Sub-Saharan Africa, which is the darker colors, relative to, and in terms of entrepreneurial activity across all these different countries. And so, you know, very simple representation that Okay, uh, we could then say, here's a story, here's a thread that we might uh, work with, and then eventually work that into an actual visualization. Um, and then doing this across you know, a couple dozen different uh, themes, going back to the original sources, um, you know, actually reading all these uh, <laughs> cheerful reports from the UN and World Bank and so on. Um, and just having this system that works, you know, from the uh, top level, really simple shareable things to the, you know, that middle level that I showed of, you know, an actual visualization uh, to the bottom where, you know, we actually had a version of that map that, uh, that allows you to actually get access to every last bit of the data. Um, and so here we can see how it, uh, how that plays out across, um, in this case, we're looking at uh, child brides. So very simple representation of, uh, 
a uh, number of girls under, under 18 who are married within a country, a uh, number percent of girls who are enrolled in high school, and also um, girls under 18 who have given birth. And so, you know, country by country, sort of seeing uh, this is not a correlation so much as a, uh, these are all, you know, factors that all have, uh, have play, and be able to um, kind of look into, you know, some of what's, what's actually happening there. Uh, the About the Data section goes through you know, where is this data coming from? What does it actually mean? What's, you know, what, what are we talking about with each of these individual stats? Uh, and then you can go another level deeper and actually see all that data play out on the, uh, uh, within that map view. And so if you really wanna dig into, you know, every last uh, piece of the, the information, you can do so. Um, so really just, you know, trying to layer together Let's get this really simple point up at, up at the top, but then let people go as, far, uh, as deep with it as they, as they want to. Um, and then doing you know, other types of outputs. So here's uh, WebGL uh, version of the map running on the, uh, running on the phone, smaller subset of data. Just interesting to get running there. Um, but it's not a matter of like doing fancier and fancier representations. Um, you know, I think a lot of the data sort of speaks for itself. This is one of my favorites as far as it's just very simple bar chart, and here's uh, PISA math score. So basically, math score in high school uh, for women, uh, women and men uh, on the left hand side, and then the percentage of women versus men who go into uh, pursue careers within uh, within math. And uh, you know, we can argue about the last 10 percent of that or 20 percent of that, but <laughs> we're talking about gaps like this. And so the same and the same thing playing out in science, though less. Uh, in a less marked uh, sort of way. Um, and we put all the data up, so really what we want is for people to like do, uh, do their own things with the data and sort of take it in different, uh, different kinds of directions. So um, yeah, so that's up at uh, noceilings.org. I encourage you to check it out. The, uh, the data itself is on GitHub. The info about that is uh, on the site as well, but I'm curious to see what you might want to do with it. And I'll end there. So thanks very much. Do we have time for some questions? And I'll let you just call on Philip. Great. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm curious about um, your uh, your dual chart achievement, which policymakers as well as millennials mm -hmm. are running. How successful do you think? Do you have any feedback about yeah, so success with those groups? We um, uh, we were more successful than I I. Uh, we were pleasantly surprised with how successful it was. We were able to, um, uh, the Google Analytics uh, stuff actually gives us a decent uh, set of feedback about um, different, um, uh, different age groups and gender and things like that, and it's an approximation, but uh, the kinds of things that we saw actually line up with real, let's see if I can find the, the chart. Um, uh, line up with actual effects. And so uh, we were very pleased with that. And also that the behaviors are totally different. So like basically that uh, people under 30 were heavily skewed towards uh, phone. Uh, people, you know, uh, during office hours were all, you know, desktop and really digging into the policy stuff. And so um, kind of an amazing, uh, let me see if I can find. Uh, reports. Mm -hmm. um, so does that dovetail with your decision for different, um, different presentations, different platforms? Yeah, so to, to my mind, what I, I would rather, I would love to keep pushing on that further. So yeah, so here's maybe the most direct version that we have of, of uh, meeting these different audiences. So. Um, <laughs> So red, women on mobile, blue, women on desktop, uh, purple, men on mobile, uh, green, men on desktop. So this huge spike here, which is, uh, so CGIU, it's a, a university-based uh, Clinton Global Initiative uh, event. And so here's this huge spike, and this is, I think, pretty evenly split between men and women who are participants. But when they demoed it on stage, here's all the women in the audience uh, pulling out their phone and actually bringing this up, and some of the men, uh, 
Chelsea Clinton goes on Kelly and Michael, you know, so the morning show. Uh, TV drives an enormous amount of traffic still. Uh, and so here's uh, women on uh, mobile, and that skewed uh, a little bit older, but actually was uh, actually skewed uh, younger than I would have expected. But basically, it's the television's on, and I pull out my phone and kind of glance at this, you know, so Chelsea Clinton says noceilings.org, and whew, it goes like that. Um, here is uh, Hillary Clinton speaking to the uh, UN the next day. Um, so, and you know, talking about the status of women. Uh, and so, I don't know if she, I think she, I can't remember if she mentioned the site or if there was just other press you know, ab about the site going along with that. So here's women on desktop. So basically all the policy people you know, kind of showing up here. Um, here's <laughs> Bill Gates and all of his Twitter followers, a bunch of men on desktop. Um, who put, you know, so Gates posts about maternal mortality and it's like all the Bill Gates wannabes all, you know, all show up. And so, um, you know, so there's, it's an approximation, but uh, this was one, one set of data, and then, but we have other, other breakdowns that actually give us better numbers in terms of uh, age ranges and, and things like that. So, um, but the other thing that we found was that I think we, um, uh, because we were trying to hew so closely to the policy thing and really kind of you know make sure that any last statement that was made could be supported by policy, uh, you know that uh, the stuff was more you know sort of more contained than uh, than it could be. And um, the uh, mobile globe thing was like kind of an afterthought, and it wound up being one of the most you know compelling, most shared you know sort of things. And it's like. But you can't do analysis with it. Like it's just it's a globe. It's on you know. But it's like yeah, this is exciting. You know, but like people were you know like um, you know sharing it around. And um, one of the uh, one of my favorite for that is um, one of the people in the studio. Her younger sister. So she pulled out the mobile globe. So here she is looking at the mobile globe. Oh well, in North Korea. You know that things aren't going that well in North Korea in terms of the uh, uh, internet usage stats. So um, you know, so here's a 20-year-old and their response to using this in the phone and whatever. So she's a character. Yep. Um, so many of us in the room today are interested in visualization to support research purposes, mm -hmm. whether it's um, exploring a data set or communicating results. I think the, um, hmm. So for me, while, uh, while doing, uh, say, my postdoc and things like that, and um, you know, while doing more of the, you know, here's publication ready uh, work and sort of explaining uh, research to people and things like that, what I found was that it was informative. So it's actually that play between. Uh, so this was the research tool that uh, folks were using internally, and I said, "Hey, you know, you can you can redesign it and actually make it clearer." And really, a lot of that has to do with removing things that are in the previous version to actually get a lot more clarity out of it. Um, and they're like, "Oh yeah, great, great." And then it wasn't until I actually took the source code and rebuilt it and said, "And here it is." And guess what? You can actually fit twice as much data on the on the screen, so I can shrink this down to half size and it's still readable versus you know, this thing too. And so um, I think what happens is that, uh, so a lot of times the, uh, for you know, research findings and representation and things like that, it's, um, a lot of it is just simply the, um, how, to keep it as, as uh, how to keep it as simple as possible and what are, you know, what are the things you can take out of it to really focus on your specific uh, point or you know, that, um, uh, one way I think about it is that, uh, you know, so when you're writing a journal article, um, you can't really get away with just doing a bolded list of like, well, I found this, and I found this, and I found this. You know, and, but the uh, thing that people tend to do when they're making a, a chart or a graphic is it's, well, I, you know, I found this, and I found this, and I found this. And so the same way that you actually have to think about how this you know, piece of text actually flows and the uh, a paragraph has a topic sentence and things like that, 
your visualization has to do the same you know, type of thing. So what is the number one overall point that people are getting when they glance at this? And you know, with that in mind, is that, the, uh, is that the thing that color is assigned to, or is that the thing that's taking up the most space in it? You know, it's a, a lot of really simple kind of things like that. Um, but also to your question in terms of from the art community, so this is the um, version of you know, sort of combining these different, uh, these different representations. And you know, this isn't really the one that they want to use to replace that previous tool. But this is a really helpful exercise in terms of, um, oh, you know what? There's this really interesting thing about doing statistics with undo and, be, and also reworking that algorithm. Because m most of the time, with this tool, people were just taking the default values and taking them as granted because it took three minutes to rerun the simulation. And so instead of, so by making it an interactive thing, people actually started thinking more about like, oh, wait, is this really a fragile stat that I'm working with? Or is it you know, actually more robust than that? And, and so on. Yep. Hey, cool stuff. Um, you Thanks. talked a little bit about sharing the different projects. I'm wondering to what extent you, in any of the work, you tried to get people socially analyzing data on the site. We, not, as, uh, not as much as I would like. I know, uh, so like Martin and Fernanda um, have done guess, some terrific stuff with that. Um, I think it's one of the, so the, for me, the, the piece of that that I'm most interested in is uh, I think there's something fascinating about when we, you know, when we post something like this, or like even if we post an article about you know, some of our work, uh, people kind of lift you know, the phrases and text and things like that that we use um, to describe the work. And it's always kind of you know, strange that it's uh, people kind of you know, play it back to us in this sort of you know, mirror version of what we had actually said. And what I would like to do is figure out how we can do that with, within visualization. So how can we sort of make these elements, but actually have it be something that's uh, customizable and shareable, but they can actually kind of add a little bit of their voice to it. You know, so how do they start working around the edges? I don't know exactly what that looks like, but that's kind of the, you know, so the point would be, how do we give people the words, you know, so like, Here's, uh, here's what we found, and here's a, language, uh, here's a visual language to talk about it. Now you take that visual language and then echo it back to other people. And so that's kind of the thing that's been rattling around a lot, especially on the No Ceilings work, because of um, the way that people, uh, it was, I think one of the interesting things for the sharing was different pockets and different communities would pick it up and have a completely different take on the same data set relative to their community. You know, so it's, uh, maternal mortality, that's, you know, those stats are going out, and it's, uh, so Bill Gates has a specific take on it. Things are getting better. We're, you know, accomplishing these goals. This is uh, one of the important millennium development goals. Uh, Melinda Gates has a uh, different take on it. Uh, these different policy people have uh, another take on it. Land use people have another take, you know, and so uh, seeing those kind of things come back, but it would be, uh, the ideal would be if we can actually arm those people with you know, uh, those kinds of representations that they can kind of work with it, so. Yeah, maybe we'll just see. follow up on that. And, uh, in many guys' work, I mean, I was really excited because mm -hmm. it seems like one of the really great things in visualizations is being catalyst for discussion and being a place for that. Yep. And, you know, where do you see that going? Are there other efforts I'd, that we should do? Yeah, I, I, haven't, I haven't seen another one like, uh, like many. It's, it's interesting because I think many eyes, uh, if it were done, Two or th you know, two years ago, a year ago, it would be a completely different animal because it was uh, held up by people weren't really thinking about the social aspect, and certainly not, definitely not the way people are now. Um, they didn't have the distribution because one, uh, you know, IBM kind of owned things, and so there's a weird thing about uh, people, you know, uploading data to IBM, but then IBM didn't want to own how people were talking with the data, and that you know that was tricky. Um, but then once they sorted that out, then they were still dealing with like sort of clunky Java and Flash applet kind of things and you know, sort of how you share stuff out that way. And that, those pieces of calculus have actually um, changed drastically. And you know, as you see with any newspaper that's doing a lot of uh, interactive graphics work you know, online. And so I think present day you could, um, I don't know, all the pieces are there. So I, I'm 
kind of wait. I'm surprised actually that it, something hasn't actually reemerged. Yeah, I, uh, it's interesting. I mean, you think about that. If that were the, uh, you know, the the China project, for instance, the people entering all of that data, uh, they were using a you know, HTML 2.0 forms based interface to like check different boxes and say this person was connected to this and whatever, and then that went through several you know backflips before it became data that we could use and uh, or that. The backflips we put it through to um, for it to be data that we could use in the front end, but you can imagine that being a very different kind of experience as far as using that tool and you know having it go all the way uh, back through that uh, that portion of it. But um, I don't have a good reference for it, but it's fun to think about. So. Well, let's, let's, well, go ahead. Uh, I'm wondering what sort of level of abstraction you've been able to achieve in creating your visualizations. Is it to say you sort of work with a catalog of off-the-shelf? visualization components that know how to do a particular graph or a particular chart or whatever? Or have you managed to be able to say, OK, we want to map this kind of data to this dimension, like X or Y or radius or color or you know, boldness or text mm -hmm. or thing, and then just sort of push a button and now put the visualization that gets what's put straight into the So uh, my personal bias is way toward the end of the scale of not using, uh, so as uh, not doing off the shelf. You know, so like I think one of the like uh, say for, you know you can see that in say something like processing where I never build a visualization library for processing and never wanted to turn processing into like the tool for building visualization. You know, and like having sort of off the shelf pieces that would and I because I kind of thought other people would would do that. And for me um, personally, the things that I find most interesting are you know uh, or I think the that initial representation stuff like getting up and running with a bar chart. Isn't, doesn't tend to be the meat of you know, how the, uh, the things that you're really going to struggle with over the course of the project. And so um, you can get through that part of the coding, but I want to keep things open enough so that you're not encouraged to sort of stop at the bar, stop at the bar chart or stop at the network and you know, things like that. And so as much as possible, we really push on the, uh, the custom things as, as, as much as we can. Um, that being said, that like, you know, for something like the no ceilings work, uh, and we're cranking out a you know number of just sort of small uh, you know so smaller interactive you know pieces. We uh, we did a lot of D three for that. We did um, some three uh, uh, JS for the you know the mobile globe you know things like that. And so um, did more of the off the shelf stuff because that that's what made sense for that you know that particular context. Um, and also in terms of the the tools that we build, I would like to have more of those abstractions kind of ready to go to say. Quick, let's get this in a map to see what it uh, see what it looks like and prove or disprove that it should actually be shown as a map. You know, um, one of the things say with the National Geographic food data, um, it's a great example of you know why not to show something as a map because the geography of that data and the um, space used by that uh, has is maybe five or six in terms of the most interesting things about each of those uh, those data points and going country by country and so. Um, we're often trying a lot of different things before we get to that final, final representation. So the more that I can encourage my guys to keep thinking broadly about that, that's kind of the stuff that we spend a lot of time struggling with. Thanks, Ben. Great. Thank you.